All right, guys, joining me right now on the show, I'm really excited to talk to this gentleman. Not only is he a fellow podcaster, but he got his start in Southern California, which you know we are definitely fans of on this brand. And not only did he get his start in Southern California, he got his his start to what would become this, this podcast, what would become a wonderful career for him at uh, some of the most famous comedy clubs, getting to cross paths with world famous comedians. I'm talking like the Seinfelds and the Mandels and definitely those, those people who being a child of the eighties and then growing up in the nineties shaped my childhood. So I know he's going to have some great stories to tell. Welcome Mr. Bruce Starr, host of the eighties golden age of comedy podcast. And you can see right there, uh, 80s golden age of comedy.com bruce man welcome thank you for coming on board and coming on to the show to talk to us today jimmy thank you for showing an interest in what i've done in the world and it turns out uh sort of being at the right place at the right time dumb luck might might have a lot to do with it but it was one of those things in life when you look back and you say wow i can't <laughs> believe that i ended up there and it's really quite a story well, hearing, you know, meeting you through our mutual buddy, Steve, but hearing where you broke into, when I first started podcasting, one of the first podcasts that I got into as a fan that made me want to do podcasting it was Joe Rogan's podcast, which is now, you know, multi-million dollar deal on Spotify. And he's, you know, about as famous as it can get, especially podcasting. But I've seen Joe do comedy multiple times. I knew him as a comedian before the fear factor thing, you know, before the UFC thing and everything. But if you listen to his show, he talks about comedy store and ice house and a lot of the clubs that you have had a relationship. And he talks a lot about what it was like, you know, years ago when, uh, you know, I guess it wasn't so, uh, people weren't so cry foul about content and everything and just how, how, you know, much fun that environment was. So I want to hear from you, man, your journey that led you into those clubs as well. What what was it? How did you find yourself there? Well, it's funny. I just got off the phone with a couple of people from Boston and they have that great Boston accent. You know, I mean, it was so cool to talk to them because I went to Northeastern University in Boston and I was there in 71 all the way to 81. I went to Northeastern. It's a five-year cooperative educational school, which is really cool because you get to spend another year in college mm -hmm. and nobody frowns at you and nobody curses at you and nobody tells you to grow up. So we mm -hmm. got another year in college. And I loved Boston so much I stayed another five years. So it was fantastic. But at the end of that 10 years, I, I had started the jewelry business and I didn't really know what to do or where to go or anything. And a couple of guys came... Uh, to Boston from L.A. because there was a writer's strike in 1980. And when there's a writer's strike, everything stops. Mm. Nobody's working, at least in the old days. Right. So those guys came back to Boston, and I didn't know them, but they were friends with guys I partied with. So all of us all got together, went out every night in Boston. It was – Boston's such a fun town. There's, there's ladies everywhere, and every September, just imagine – a place where every September, where there's 124 colleges and universities, every September, a whole new crew of, I'll say, ladies. Yeah, yeah. Look, looking for experiences. And anyway, I picked a great school to go to. So uh, at the end of that stay of 10 years, they said, what are you doing, man? Uh, uh, I told them, well, I'm, I'm kind of retired of my jewelry business. I used, to, I used to travel all around the country doing trade shows. So I was actually in show business from 75 to, to 70 uh, to, to 80. Yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, they said, why don't you come out to L.A.? We'll hook you up. We'll get you going. We'll do whatever they, we can for you. And that was all I needed to hear. Oh, my God. Because... A few months before that, I'm sitting in my living room in Boston, and I see this personal manager named Jay Bernstein, and he's getting out of a car with Farrah Fawcett and getting yeah. onto a red carpet. And I'm going, oh, my God, what a life. Yeah. If I could have just a little piece of that, 
I want to go for that. So when those guys said, come on out to LA, I said, yeah. And I sold everything, packed up everything. And I drove out to LA. And the first night I was there, my sister lives there. The first night I was there, my buddy who went to Northeastern with me, Mitch, he picked me up and he said, you want to be in show business? I'm taking you to show business. He took me over to the improv. He pushed me out of the car. He said, you look for these comedians and this is where you're going to live from now on. Wow. I looked around and there was, you know, Jerry Seinfeld was walking in and out and a lot of guys that weren't famous yet, but right. there were fairly well-known comics. And I started hanging around with these comedians and they introduced me to everybody. Before you knew it, I knew a lot of the guys. And then uh, one of the, the one of the guys named Barry Martyr, who wrote for all the comedians, said, hey, you're living with your sister. Why don't we get a place and we'll help each other in the business? I said, wow, OK, great idea. We found a place walking distance in the improv. We never walked it once. But it was walking distance in the Nobody walks in L.A., OK? It just, it just doesn't happen. I remember looking down at my legs after living there for like, five years. And I said, where did these chicken legs come from? There's like no <laughs> muscle left. You don't walk anywhere. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little uh, sidetracked, but he and I became roommates and he wrote for everybody. And then one night I walked into the improv, probably late 81. And it, I was expecting a sleepy place like it usually is. The comedians, eh, they go in and out, uh, people go in and out. And then there was this production going on. And I said, wow, what is this? And they said, well, Evening at the Improv is in production. And that's when they started shooting shows with the most incredible guest hosts like Phyllis Diller and Jackie yeah. Mason and Vincent Price and uh, uh, Sergeant Bilko. I can't remember his name, but incredible people like that were hosting the show and introducing the comedians. Well, I thought my mind was going to burst just from being able to meet these people and talk to them and be a part of this. If you look in some of the earlier uh, shows, I was sitting in the audience, you know, laughing along with everybody. I was, I wanted to get in any way that I could. And at first it was being in the audience. But anyway, as those shares, the show started airing, uh, comedy club started jumping up all over the country and went on to syndicated television and boom, everybody opened up a comedy club and the comedians were kind of stuck a little bit because the big time agents didn't want to make the calls from them. it wasn't worth it. It was too small of money mm -hmm. and they didn't want to call. My roommate said, why don't you call for them? They know you, they like you, they trust you. I said, I don't want to be an agent. That's what agent does. I don't want to be an agent. I said, everybody hates their agent. I don't want to do something that who everybody hates. So mm -hmm. he said, just do it. You'll put money in your pocket. You'll put money in their pocket. I said, okay. And I started talking to the guys and all of them said, yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, I wasn't stepping on anybody's toes. I wasn't stepping on their manager's toes. I wasn't stepping on their uh, agents that got them sitcoms or movies. I was just me, the personal appearance agent who was getting them placed in comedy clubs around the country. Mm -hmm. And it started growing and growing, growing. Before too long, I had about 35 stand-up comedians and really good ones. Howie Mandel said he would be, before Howie was Howie, but he was right. still brilliant. Uh, uh, a real hit for me was Murray Langston, the unknown comic. He had already been on 150 gong shows, and everybody knew Murray from being the unknown comic. He was a client, Paul Reiser, Bobby Slayton, uh, Paula Poundstone, uh, Larry Miller. I can go on and on about all the guys that I was uh, uh, not lucky enough, but I was at the right place at the right time. They needed me. I needed them. And I started a little business for myself. The thing that when you came on board to this, like, I know in like fandoms and stuff, it gets talked about with like Saturday Night Live a lot, where like the class of talent. So, like going back to like the Bill Murray, Belushi, like that group. 70s. 70s. And then, you know, you had a little bit 
of a weight, but then along came Sadler, Spade, uh, Farley, like that group. And nowadays you get like your principal cast and you may have like one or two names that are like really the gems or the diamonds in the rough of that class, but it's not like that collective thing. So when you're talking about traveling across country and breaking into this scene when you did, this really is like the Renaissance class of stand-up comedy. Absolutely. Where, and that's why I call it the golden age of comedy. I call it that for two reasons. One, the, the evening at the improvs, the Showtime specials, the HBO specials just skyrocketed all the comedians. Right. And it didn't happen overnight because all these guys that were able to get on these shows, they were working in the late 70s, working their butts off and struggling uh, at the improv in New York City and at the comedy store on Sunset. They were struggling. It was hard for them, but they, they, they got themselves together just when the improv hit. And there were four or five, six comedians on each show. And they were getting TV time and they were getting recognized. And they started getting more and more confidence. The second reason, and this is after, I, would, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this before I started my, I've already done 40 shows. I've already had 40 video uh, podcasts with wow. comedians and producers and uh, just everybody that had anything to do with the great, the golden age of comedy. But the second reason what made that time so special, and this is what they taught me show after show after show was the camaraderie that they had with each other. They, mm -hmm. the support, the goodness, the kindness, the generosity. I'll give you a, for instance, someone told me about, Oh yeah, I just came out from New York and I really wanted to work the comedy club. I wanted to work uh, uh, up on Sunset, and I was walking around a comedy club, and I saw Jay Leno. And Jay Leno recognized me from New York and said, hey, man, what are you doing out here? Well, I just got out here, and I, you know, I'd really like to get a spot on the, uh, the comedy store. He said, come on. Come with me. He walked them in, introduced them to Mitzi Shore, who owned the comedy club, and said, Mitzi, this guy is gold, fantastic comedy from New York. And he said, she said, okay, on your word, Jay, on your word, David Letterman, on your word, J.J. Walker, I'll put him on. Now, that means that there's going to be one less spot on that card for him or somebody else. Right. That's the way it was. They supported each other. They liked each other. They traveled together. And it was a very golden age in comedy, not just because of the, the, the rising stars, but it was gold the way all the comedians treated each other. Was it kind of like a snowball effect? Because you mentioned Seinfeld and then you mentioned Paul Reiser and both of them, you know, came into television success right around the same time with Jerry's Seinfeld and then uh, Mad About You with Paul and Helen Hunt like that. I can remember, you know, like NBC had Seinfeld, Mad About You was like CBS or something, but they were – right you know paralleling each other as far as competing for those ratings like in, out of that group of guys though because howie same time i mean he he had the the voice acting with like bobby's world and stuff but then he's getting you know noticed more and more like it seems like as they're breaking in with stand-up that in turn is like directly breaking them into just entertainment in general well let me tell you how that happened because people outside the industry wouldn't know this, but every time they went up on stage, you didn't know who was in the audience. It could have been 20 drunks. It could have been 30 people from Omaha. But many times there was a casting director from mm. a up and coming sitcom. There was a producer. There was somebody who needed a, a, a day part and they wanted a comedy guy. So they went to the improv that night or they went to the comedy store. And sometimes I'd look around and there'd be a few of them because mm. they knew that the improv and the comedy store were gold for finding new up and coming talent. And sometimes they'd have industry night where they would literally invite agents and managers and producers. 
and they would put eight or 10 guys up there. And th these producers, casting directors, agents, managers, they saw an eyeful of some spectacular talent that weren't quite known yet. So when you see Tim Allen, they found him on stage. When you see Roseanne, they found her on stage. You name it, Freddie Prinze, Paul Rodriguez, you name the show, they found them on the stages of the comedy store or the improv. A lot of people don't know that. With you getting to have a relationship with these guys, and you talked about how they were traveling around together, supporting each other. Did you get to do any like traveling back then with any of them? <laughs> One of my best stories ever was Murray, uh, the unknown comic. He is the funniest guy alive. Okay. He's just crazy. You should see the show that we did together uh, on the eighties golden age of comedy. Everybody should watch the Murray Langston show on the 80s golden age of comedy. This guy is like 72 or 73 or something like that. And he's still carrying on like a, like a crazed teenager. Yeah. So my roommate, who I told you about, wrote for everybody, wrote for uh, Murray. And one day Murray said, asked Barry to uh, be his opening act in Dallas. And he's Bruce, you come on too. So he took me and Barry, and Barry was his opening act. And the three of us went to Dallas for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, from the time he got on the plane and what he was doing to the stewardesses, to the time we got to the hotel, to the time we went to the restaurants, and he was t terrorizing and torturing the waitresses, and everybody was hysterical. It was the funniest I mean, he, it's just natural. It just comes out of him. It's a lot like Robin Williams, a lot like it might have been with uh, Jonathan Winters. It just was natural for him. He is just a funny guy. So imagine going on the road with uh, Murray Langston for a whole weekend, going to Dallas and just ha just opening up your world to what it's like to travel with a comedian for a whole weekend. <laughs> was he just – <clears throat> center of attention everywhere you guys went. Well, he didn't draw it to himself. Yeah. He didn't do stupid big things. He, right, was, right. he was just funny one on one with everybody. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't obnoxious. He he was just got everybody laughing. It just had fun with everybody and everybody had fun with him. It was priceless. In, in the the age that we are in now and how stand-up has you know evolved to the point now where, um, especially over the course of 2020, where you couldn't go to these clubs necessarily um, in person. There are some of them that were doing like a, almost like an open mic night thing that I thought was pretty cool where they would host – you know, a, a, a thread. And then if you were, you know, an inspiring comedian that was trying to get their material out there, they were essentially like, okay, from eight to eight Oh seven, it's you, you're going to pop up on the screen. You're going to be live to however many people are watching. And then you're going to get like a two minute uh, notice. And then it's going to, you know, take you off when your time is up type of a thing. I thought that that, was pretty um, cool to sit there and be able to watch because that was I came from a theater background, so the whole the stage and in performing in front of people live. Uh, even when I turned to film school, you kind of get it when you like show a finished film to a, a crowd of people for the first time. You're you're like gauging their reaction like that. But man, there's nothing like going to a, a comedy club or live theater performance and just kind of feeling that energy in the, in the room. If you can, if you can get them. And Absolutely. One of the, one of the guys described it, uh, one of the comedians, Steve Middleman, who uh, won the 81 New York laugh off. Hmm. And he was a newer comedian and he beat a guy named uh, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> And he beats Carol Liefer and he beats uh, Rick Overton. 
And here was this newer, newer guy. Anyway, he said that he was hired in this last year to do Zoom presentations. Hmm. And imagine doing stand-up like this. No yeah. one's laughing. Can't hear anybody. And maybe after a while, he would see LOL in the log. Yeah, right. Or ha ha. So he told me that was one of those difficult gigs for, for him because you, you're talking to yourself. It's, yeah. But it's going to change because I am putting together an 80s golden age of comedy tour with all the headliners wow. that I did. In uh, in L.A., I'm gonna I'm bringing them all together, and I'm taking them all across the country. We're setting up '80s Golden Age of Comedy tours everywhere, and uh, I, I talk to all the guys here, the podcasters. If you know comedy clubs and you think uh, they have the kind of audience that can handle three headliners, three headliners that have all appeared in Vegas and Atlantic City, top top notch guys. That's the kind of shows that I'll be putting together over the next uh, few years. That is awesome. That is something that we have been missing, I think, as stand-up fans since uh, uh, Foxworthy and Cedric the Entertainer put together both the uh, Blue Collar and Kings of Comedy. Right. Troops, the, those troops. And what made the Kings of Comedy so good is that everybody was a headliner. Yeah. And yeah. That's, what, that's what I'm putting together. There's no drunk opening acts who screws things up, and there's no <laughs> middle acts that may be good, may be bad. By the time the headliners ready to come on, they're bored, they're 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 sick, they're tired. Uh uh, yeah. it's going to be three headliners at my '80s golden age of comedy uh, uh, shows. And by the way, if people want to be put on the mailing list for any event that I do, and you want to be you want to be, uh, you know, given some uh, information about it, you can uh, go to my 80s golden age of comedy and just drop me a line, you know, just tell me who you are and leave me your email and I'll put you on a mailing list. So you'll know when the best shows ever come around to your area, uh, you'll know about it. That's, yeah, that's really, really cool, man. That uh, is something too that we're definitely like ready to get out and do stuff again. Like we um, just, I just filmed a film that's part of a bigger film, but the film that we just filmed right now is a little 12 minute short, but I used a lot of the actors. So I'm in Northern California. My cast was presumably are uh, mostly uh, actors who acted in the Bay area, like theater actors who weren't, their theaters are closed right now. And I, you know, I was thanking them for coming out and everything and doing an audition. And they, and they were all, you know, pretty much like, dude, thank you for giving us something to do. Like everybody has got to be hungry to, oh. especially in the entertainment. Like, again, it goes back to that live performance thing. Like if you have it in you to perform in front of people and then you're not allowed to do it for a year and a half, like, you like I can only imagine like those guys are going to be killing people in on that audience like people are going to be dying of laughter. Well, in the in those interviews, I heard oh, I'm just sitting home. I have nothing to do. I have no place to go. I can't do anything. And I kept hearing that over and over again. And I finally said, "Wait a second. I know this thing is going to break down very very soon. Probably a lot sooner than people think. And yeah. this is going to open up." And uh, they all want to go out and I'm going to be, be there again for them 30, 35, 40 years later to get them out on the road. And I'll tell you, a couple of months ago, I went out to see my friend Bruce Smirnoff, uh, who's one of the funniest guys. He's not a household word, but he's one of the funniest guys. And th they were performing uh, in like a little party room above an Italian restaurant in Boca Raton, Florida. And mm -hmm. it's kind of, you don't expect much and, it's an Italian restaurant, and it was Bruce Smirnoff. It was Don Gavin, who is the godfather of Boston comedy. Is Eddie uh, uh, Rich Richie Minervini, who's like the uh, what do they call him, the king of Long Island comedy, and uh, Jimmy Schubert, who just moved from California to Florida. 
they had these four guys, and I was sitting in the in in the like the the room with them talking and chatting. I didn't really know too many of them, just Bruce Manoff. And we, I went out and went into the room to watch the show with everybody else. They killed after not working for a whole year. They were they were people were could, couldn't catch their breath. People were, couldn't wait to laugh. They were so ready to be entertained. And yeah. these people who were not headline, these are not like known headliners. They were spectacular, so funny. And I hope to be able to take these guys that put on that show and take them out on the road. Right on. The the more, the, the better, man. Like the more shows, I mean, even it gets to a point where hell, who knows, maybe there's like two 80s tours going simultaneously. No doubt about it, because I've got 40 comics. Well, there you, know? you go. So there you go. It could be three or four or five of them. There's no need for, oh, they're only in Tulsa. No, no, no. They're going to be in other places. Yeah, that's awesome. The I got to ask, with with being in the, the 80s, you know, improv and comedy story, you have seen – the scene really evolve into something, you know, different than what it is or what it was now or back then, as far as what people, I guess, have to be consciously aware of in the age of like social media and the fact that once you get to a certain level, the sad reality is, is once you get to a certain level, and I'm sure it was true back then too, but now because everyone has a, a computer in their hand and the access is immediately, you know, readily available, that you almost have to be careful about what you joke about and versus, you know, the amount of stuff that you could get away with. And Obviously, if someone is abundantly an asshole, they're abundantly an asshole, no matter what kind of jokes, whatever they're telling. But for you, to someone who is trying to break into the scene now, to those young comics that are going to the improv and the comedy store in 2021 versus the 80s, what advice would you give them to almost... Uh, I guess if you if you were going to say the reemergence of what the '80s was, what do you think like that the scene that it is today needs to like almost brew that new class of the guys that you now be call friends? So I got to tell you, I am less of an expert on today's scene than you are. I got you. Okay. Because when I left the comedy scene out of Hollywood, I went. New York or Florida, mm -hmm. there was no way that I could go and see local comedy yeah. with, with beginners. I, I, I couldn't wait to leave. Mm. But I will say this. Anyone that watches my 80s golden age of comedy videos, and now I'm up to 40 of them. So in my, my website, there's no apostrophe after 80s. It's just 80s goldenageofcomedy.com. Gotcha. If any comedian who wants to learn the right way to come up, just watch my videos because it seemed like almost every one of the comedians wanted to help whoever was coming up now. Gotcha. They said things. Uh, this is what they should do. This is what they shouldn't do. And they were really, in every one of my shows, they were saying something to help the comedians. Now, they also said that a lot of the current comedians, other than a few of the, the super, super duper headliners, um, they lack structure. And they were just going for the joke. And these guys that uh, were working at it for 10 years, they would tell you there was a lot of structure. When you look at Jerry Seinfeld, it's a very structured uh, appearance, presentation. Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys, they worked very, very hard to get that act down. It, it's very few of them are off the cuff. So the other thing I would tell them to do is get in front of people as much as you can. You talked about those uh, amateur 
open mic nights. Get up and on in front of a group. Get up in front of the mic as often as you can because that's really the only way that you're going to learn what works, what doesn't work. Take that tape recorder, that, that voice recorder, record everything that you do, and and just work real hard. And unless you're like 100% determined to become a comedian, find something else to do because it's way too hard, way too hard to do what it, to take what it takes, to do what it takes to be a stand-up comedian. Yeah, the business and what itself, there's always the statistic they throw at you, at least my, the, with our little group kind of called the real world teachers in film school because you have those teachers that are like as soon as you're out of film school like hey so and so went here and so and so went here and so and so went here and we know that you are going to be the next and so and so once you graduate from here and then you had the real world teachers that were like listen man like over here is hiring if i were you like i'd go talk to them because they know this one person who I know knows like a dude at a production company, like they're trying to pull those strings, but they're like telling you like, you better like fucking have another way of income. Cause you, you're not just walking into my, uh, Michael Bay's house and getting handed a check to go make what you think is a good movie. And those are always the teachers that I thought were like more helpful in a sense of like, Hey, this is what life is really like in any entertainment business. But stand-up comedy, I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking of like, here's the entertainment industry in a pie, like film production. You can like cut like almost a, half of it just within the jobs within there. But then I'm like, stand-up comedy, to break into that, that is such a small piece of the pie as far as like you're saying, there are like two, three headliners that are like nationally exposed, you, should, you could say right now. Like, yeah, that's incredibly, incredibly hard. But man, like I would say that don't give up. Keep going. If you're if you're funny, like the world wants to hear your jokes. You know, if, if you want to know the difference without me telling you difference in comedy, the yeah. difference in the world made it possible for the comedians to do comedy back then. Rent, they might it might have been four hundred dollars and they might have shared it with three people. Yeah. Gas was 69 cents a gallon. A, 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 a gallon of milk was a, a 79 cents. Yeah. So, and then you could arrange to eat someplace. Yeah. Or you could get a waiter job. Or I don't see that happening. That I don't see that happening now. Not when rent is 2,500, 3,500 a month. Right. A totally different environment. Yeah. The, uh, you mentioned how like Jerry Seinfeld had that structure down and you get, you don't never even have to like go have had seen him live because he gives you a taste of that structure that he uses in his act in the shows intro and outro each week. And you see him with structure. That's a great way to describe it. Set up his joke, deliver that punchline. And then the after like, and that's the story. And so I'm curious, like, out of the guys that had that, like, that character, that structure to them on stage, what percentage would you say that's all complete BS and he completely did that solely for his stand-up act versus, no, that's, like, actually, like, how his friend and he just delivers his, his like, one-on-one -on -one jokes the exact same way and that's just who he is? Well, let's think of Seinfeld the show. If you thought that they just dreamt up all those things that happened, no, no. yeah, you, you can't, you can't. Yeah. It happened. Going out to Fire Island, that happened. You know, uh, going going the distance with who could keep their hands off themselves the longest. I mean, yeah. that had to have happened. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you how they do it. They in the old days they would have a pad. Mm -hmm. They would have a pen or pencil, and they would just write down everything that they saw that even had a chance of being funny. And they wrote it down, and then through the structure of knowing the flow of how a joke works, 
they mm -hmm. get from here's what happened. This seems if it if it came out funny like this, and then it was their job to get it from how it happened to funny. Mm -hmm. Those three or four seconds where they set up the joke, mm -hmm. that's how you structure comedy. The other day I had on Gabe Abelson, and Gabe was up for five Emmy Awards for late night comedy writing on The Letterman Show, on Jay Leno. And he went, if you see that show, he will explain the structure of what it took to write comedy jokes for Jay, for David. There's an absolute structure that's involved. And it's like in four parts. It can't be six. It can't be two. It's four parts. So the, the thing is you have to understand comedy. Any of the younger kids that think they could just get up there because they're funny in high school, maybe they will be funny. But will they last or will they have the kind of material that they could do for a half hour, 40 minutes? Right. Maybe not. Maybe not. The Getting to hear you talk about your show and some of the people that you've had on as guests on your show, how has that been – for you as far as you were living the business or you still are living the business as you get ready to tour again. But then I know for me, like in doing this for like you, it's all, me interviewing you for my show here. It's always been really fun for me to do that. Cause it's like you getting to, it's like getting reminded like what the goal is. Like I, graduated film school, trying to like break into that industry. Like that is where I'm at currently. Like I've made independent films. Like now I'm taking my resume and I am taking, you know, my knowledge and I am like trying to find a job. So I know what, I know that feeling of like, you're trying to break in, but then I get to interview like you or I've interviewed, you know, I actually just recently interviewed Vincent Price's daughter. And I'm like listening to these stories about people that I was a fan long before I was a student and definitely long before a filmmaker. And it's like, you're getting to talk to the people that you are fans of and they have like these stories. And it's like, it's like circle of life almost. Like it reminds you, no, I am like driven to go do this type of a thing. So for you, having had the career that you have and knowing the people that you have had, what has it been like for you putting your show together and then getting to like sit down and interview them and ask them questions and stuff about their careers? I'll tell you where the gold is. And it's, I, I, it's blowing my mind just as I'm going to tell you this story. When I was their agent, they weren't about to share any weaknesses. They mm -hmm. weren't about to share any vulnerabilities. All they could share was funny jokes and get me here and get me booked here and get me booked there and enjoying each other with high levels of professionalism. But as I'm interviewing them, I'm asking them about their childhood. Mm. I'm asking them about what it was like to grow up in their family. Did their family help them or hinder them? And what was it like those years of the struggle when you first decided you wanted to be a, a stand-up and then the struggle of waiting a line, I didn't know any of those things before. And now I know all of their not so famous moments, right. not so moments of, of bravado and I'm a star. I'm getting to know their stories at very basic levels. And it's been amazing getting to know them, all of them on that level. That's, yeah, that's really cool that you get to, it's almost like you get to a next level of friendships. Like you've had the business and now it's like you're getting to actually like know that real inside side of their things, not just the business side of things. And, and that's why when I uh, approaching them and saying, you know what, you guys want to work. I'm putting clubs together. I'm putting theaters together. So, after we've had these intimate shows together, they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're exactly who I'd like to work with. And it's, it's, it's gold all over again uh, to be able to establish, reestablish these relationships with these greats uh, and on a professional level again. 
Well, yeah, man, I absolutely, I cannot wait to hear uh, when these tour dates start dropping here sooner than later. And then we get, uh, so your podcast, I know you have videos of all these interviews at your website, the 80, 80s with no apostrophe on the website there, golden age of, of uh, comedy.com. And uh, I know the videos are on there, but if they listen to like where they listen to podcasts, are you posting these interviews? Yes, I am. They, they, I have a page on my website uh, called Invited Guest. Okay. And every time somebody like you sends me a video or an audio, I put it right up there and they can listen to that. So, oh. and um, let me tell you something. Some of the questions I'm being asked on these shows, <laughs> people are really getting a lot of good stuff out of me because I haven't had to share this part of me for 30, 40 years. Yeah. And you guys are getting me, man. You're getting me to talk <laughs> about things that I haven't talked about. In the, my friends don't know this about me. My wife may not even know everything about me, but it's certainly the friends now. Do I talk about comedy, golden age of comedy? They might not even know that I did that. It's, now they're starting to hear about it because it's getting a little bit, you know, bigger. But they had no idea. Nobody did. The. And that's pretty wild to have like known the the people that you do and, and having the stories that you you undoubtedly have to not want to uh, shout them from the rooftops. That's like I can remember the first time we got hired to do a live like Comic Con panel production, and we're going up on stage with uh, some of the people. Um, that were ghosts like Stay Puff the Marshmallow Man and stuff from the Ghostbusters movies. And, you know, meeting them in the green room and like getting to talk to them a little bit before we went to in front of this crowd of people to do it. Like they were the most normal, chill, like low key and like 99% of the time, that is how it is. Like everyone is just so like and it's not meant to be like some kind of put down or anything but normal like you're a normal person i'm approaching you we're having a normal chill conversation it's not like what you as a fan build it up in your head to be and uh getting to see that peek behind the curtain versus uh 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 like meet and greet or a, a signature or a photo or something at the bigger cons, but actually getting to like sit down with like me, them, maybe one other person and like actually be like, yeah, like working on this, like, Hey, you know what? Don't ask me any questions because this guy's a dick and he's actually been a dick to a lot of people. Like when you've already got that level of comfortability down and then you go out in front of like 500 people and have this like conversation conversation that you have in front of the large crowd 99 percent of the time is a hell of a nice conversation and they're already ready to like share like you said that personal information and like let you in a little bit more that is an interviewer who has a particular interest in the industry that you're interviewing the person about is like the peak of interviewing i think that's why they all trusted me and that's why every one of these shows is an incredible quality professional broadcast because when they watched my shows before accepting my invitation, they said, man, you do a good show. This is not just, that's not three guys in beards hanging around drinking beers and you're the fourth one in the room. No, this is a professional uh, presentation that you're doing. And I'd be proud to be on the show. And that's why only one person has said no to me. Uh, and, and you know, maybe she was just too busy, but everybody else said, yeah, it's why not? I mean, what is it an hour? And granted, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people doing, uh, podcasts now, but you know, I'm giving them a chance to share a piece of their life that oh. they never shared before. It's not two or three minute sound bites. I'm giving yeah. them a chance to share their story. For their kids, their grandkids, their great grandkids will be able to watch grandma, grandpa <laughs> share their story. Yeah, for sure. That yeah, that is one thing, you know, we you know in doing you know, podcasting that I've come 
to find out that the interviews that are always like that, where they're not just, I mean, sure, you like, you are going on tour again, or you're working with such and such a person, or this is about to come out, you're about to be able to see this. Like, we absolutely, we're talking that right out the gate, because that's exciting stuff to talk about. But then, like, the fan of me as an interviewer, like, no, man, like, I want to know, like, you were on this set or, you know, you knew this person or, you know, what have you, like, what was that like too? Like your in-depth conversation stuff is always the more, I feel like the better interview question type of a thing. You know, all I could say is they were off the charts to be able to walk around the sets of Laverne and Shirley. And these are old, you know, happy days because a client was on there and I was able to walk around uh, these sets, Boy Meets World. I went to every taping for years. Wow. My, buddy Mitch, my buddy Mitch Bank had an, a nice little part there where he was the, did the warm up. He had some production, a lot of production skills. It's, it's I always loved being behind the scenes. I don't want to be in front of a camera where uh, a million people are going to be watching. That was never me. I'm yeah. comfortable here talking to you. Hey, if 10,000 people see this eventually, great. But if they, you know, 1,000 people, great. But I, I don't want to be in front of 10,000 people in, a, in an audience. That was never me. So that's why becoming an agent was better for me because I was working behind the scenes. Now, you brought up the, the comedy conventions. I'm going to be doing something that I'm, I'm going to – you're going to be one of the first ones to hear me say this on a podcast. Are you ready? I'm ready. When I was growing up, there were some incredible black and white shows on TV. Mm -hmm. There was the Donna Reed show. There was Leave it to Beaver. There was My Three Sons. There was mm -hmm. Ozzie and Harriet. I can go on and on and on. Well, some of those, uh, Dennis the Menace, some yeah. of those shows, those people are still alive and well. Uh, Lassie with John Provost. Oh, yeah. I have connected with people that I'm going to be booking. Wow. Those kids on shows all around the country. I might do Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow and a, and a Leave it to Beaver show all around the country. I'll do uh, uh, Stanley Livingston of Chip from My Three Sons and his brother and and other guys that are still healthy enough, I'm going to start booking them all around the country. They're going to do presentations. It's not just going to be signing autographs. They'll be doing presentations. They'll be sitting around on a round table talking about their, what it was like back then. And then people will be able to take pictures with them. I'll get them signed and autographed. So if anybody wants to be a part of that, again, Go to my 80s golden age of comedy, 80s golden age of comedy, and write down, uh, set, leave me your name and mailing address, and I'll get you on a mailing list because these shows are going to be priceless. And you know what? All these people, they're not going to last forever. They're getting old. So I want to get them uh, on stage around the country sooner than later. Right on, man. Well, everybody, go check out. 80s golden age of comedy .com. You can see what Bruce is up to. If you listen to us on podcast versus watching the video, check out how you're listening to us. Chances are you're going to get uh, search 80s golden age of comedy and you will find Bruce's podcast feed there and you can listen to it there. Either way, man, we uh, look forward to seeing this tour develop sooner than later. We look forward to seeing, uh, more of your uh, video interviews and your future guests. And uh, we will have to uh, get you back on uh, and uh, catch up and see what you're up to here in a little while and do another one of these, man. But this was a blast. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.